when you opened those clothing stores, do you mind me asking what year was that? 6970. Okay. So politically turbulent. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there were the, the bank in front of one store was burned down. The constant in Berkeley, it was constant riots you know, with police and heads getting broken in and stuff like that. Yeah, it was very politically turbulent. Sure, sure. Uh, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 it, that's okay. The clothing that you were um, selling, were you finding the designers and then they had No, already... no I, I had two partners. One of them went to shows in New York four times a year. So it was kind of like priced for students, but kind of like trendy stuff. You know, affordable and trendy, as I would describe it. The, the, the store was called the Rag Theater. We thought we'd get rich immediately and do movies. Uh, we forgot that you have to work 80 hours a week <laughs> to compete with the store up the street, let alone boarding up the windows for the riots. Interesting. Was this more sort of a beatnik look? Sort of no, bell bottoms? No, 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 no. Okay. trendy. Trendy. Oh, trendy. okay. So yeah. that wasn't considered trendy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Hmm. And, uh, what ultimately caused you to close the stores? Uh, my, f call this fate. Okay, so I'm, I'm working with a, a largely transvestite troupe called the Cockettes, C-O-C-K-E-T-T-E-S, <laughs> in San Francisco. Uh -huh. And it's my first, you know, I'm, I'm writing, I'm directing, and although I'm an ugly drag, I'm performing with them. And... Uh, it was just a coincidence that some of the key politically placed members of the troupe happened to like stuff in my clothing store. So it was, uh, anyway, anyway, we won't go into the things we have to do. <laughs> and I've got some material for the show. And sure, I'll put a dress on. You, you know, but uh, some guy, like Johnny Depp could look beautiful. I, I'm ugly in drag. <laughs> Skarsgård's beautiful too. When yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, my jaws too. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, anyway. So uh, uh, the Coquettes were supposed to go to this festival of new theater in uh, okay, where, not Toronto in Toronto. Okay, festival of new theater in Toronto, uh, but it was just too big, too unwieldy a group to make it there. Okay, my father has a mild heart attack in northeastern Canada. I drop what I'm doing, fly to see him, he's okay, take care of it, figure out a way to, you know, I'm there for a week, they've got a car and a trailer arranged to get that back, he's okay. I stop in Toronto on the way back to see this theater festival. I run into some scruffy French troupe called the Grand Magic Circus doing some like street theater and they're going to be in the Festival of New Theater. There was something about them, a charisma, a panache, a lan. Could you use a little percussion background <laughs> in the show? <laughs> May we? Will you give me three minutes and someone to play an Eric Satie piece where I do this? It's like a horror drag thing. Uh, it worked out really, really well. I had, you know, rented some drums. Six months later, Peter Brook from the Royal Shakespeare Company picks them up in Paris and says, uh, I'm going to put you in an 800 seat theater and give you full backing. I get a letter from Paris. You want to join the company. And I don't know who's seen a film, uh, Children of Paradise, or in French, Les Enfants de Paradis, about mm -hmm. the French theater scene in the 1830s, the high theater and the low theater. It's like a three and a half hour film, amazingly done during World War II. But they did it. It was one of those epiphanies for me. I, I saw it, walked out of the theater, turned around, saw it again. So this was, do you want to come to Paris and be in this theater company? So I sold out of the, the stores. I, I gave my interest to my partners, went to Paris, and the show was a huge hit. It filled 800 seats for over a year. Uh, and the director, Jerome Savary, went on to become the director of the French National Theater. So I'm working with kind of new people and also like veterans of the Comédie Française. And nothing teaches timing than live stage, period, period. Uh, and, <laughs> and, you know, we worked every day. I only saw like the Eiffel Tower and the Louvre and those things years later when I went back to visit. 
And what happens with a hit show, um, if we had a day off, then there's a commercial and I don't look like it, but I got modeling gigs, which I've always looked at myself as like ugly and bizarre and clown-like. So that was like a, I would call that an ego boost, where I just had to stand there and act cool. <laughs> I'm not classically handsome, but oh yeah, cool American. Uh. <laughs> So that, and I, you know, and, and I'd send the magazines back to my mother who'd show them to her girlfriends. And, you know, that was, uh, anyway, uh, no modeling gigs recently. What's that? <laughs> maybe if I get my teeth whitened and I've had my nose fixed twice, but maybe I'll get a smaller one the next time. It's from boxing. <laughs> it seems like though you, you I, I see this image of your life that you've like, these, these opportunities have presented themselves. Or as most people would say, well, that sounds really cool, but I have to stay with this. And you're like, I'm going for it. Is that, is that accurate that you... you yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, my media empire, Buzzine, uh, I ultimately lost it. You know, and then I have a film. You know, but, you know, I, it, it wasn't like a, a, a pleasant landing. It was like I fell off the roof. You know, mm. but you get up, get your breath again. God, I, okay, this is... When I was in this boxing stable, I, I won't say his name because he was this tough old son of a bitch. Uh, and I've worked with Rod Steiger on the waterfront with Marlon Brando doing this thing. I could have been a contender, but he sold him out for the short money. So this was one of the toughest trainers in the business. But as a manager, he would his fighters would win 10 fights. Then he'd outclass them and they'd lose the next 10 for the short money. Oh. And you'd see guys with slurred speech in their mid-30s. So, uh, but he was an amazing trainer. But almost every day, at, for some imagined infraction, I'd have to hold my arms open, and he'd hit me in the solar plexus and knock all the wind out of me, where it takes like 1,000, 2,000, you know, three, to get you, your first breath back. And you realize that you can still breathe, you haven't been hurt, and you can even keep boxing in that state. Uh, did a little damage in here, the acid reflux, but uh, that, that and a, a neck, neck, neck hairline fractures and broken hands. Oh. <laughs> they fixed the nose good though. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I almost see that you've taken opportunities in your life and, and it's almost like swinging from one vine to the next. Yeah, w with falling down. Sure, sure. And climbing up the tree again. Right, right. Yeah. Whereas yeah. most people would have been too squeamish and maybe they wouldn't have had the adventure. You definitely get knocked down and you're definitely going to have more failures than successes. But you keep going. You keep going. Did you ever worry about playing it too safe? No. <laughs> Not Richard Elfman. It's, uh, if anything, it's, uh, you know, how far do I let myself go? Okay. So on the flip side then, have you ever been told, can you reel it back in? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, yeah. and how do you respond to that? I don't really reel it back in much. <laughs> oh, although I, I don't, I, I don't, I, I no longer do anything illegal. Oh, no, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah, not advising that. <laughs> I'm within the, yeah, everything right. within, within the, that's yeah, legal yeah, and, and no one's harmed. Do, yeah, yeah. But I'm saying in terms of having fun, because you can still have fun and be wild and crazy and not hurt anybody. Yeah. Um, have you ever been told, hey, can you rein it in and that's just not your style and you realize that that's not for you then? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I've, I've been a hired gun as a director where I have to... It, it, here's the thing with, with film. It's a collaborative medium and you have to get other opinions no matter how much of an auteur you think you are. And certain opinions will really help you. But then you get all these other people that, that don't belong there, particularly <laughs> in film, uh, giving opinions and they don't know what they're talking about. You know, so that's something you have to deal with. How do you know when to silence those and when to, how do you know who, whose voice you're gonna listen to? Oh, Aside you, from who's signing you, your check. You, you know, you know. I mean, also, what have they done? It, you know, this editor has done these 12 films that you love my God, I don't just want his opinion, I'll pay for his opinion. Uh, this sleazy exec kind of 
often in film, the, the, the biggest ability is kind of climbing the corporate ladder, not knowing how to make a film. You know, so they, to justify their existence, they're giving opinions. Don't know what they're, I, I did some network television for a while and suffered with that. I, I won't get into it. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, don't, won't get into it. 